Hey guys, how you doing? We're going good. Should I close my closet or should I leave it open? Is my closet with my shirts and my books bothering you? Thank the Father. Thank the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Forgive me, Baby. Lord Jesus, forgive me, Holy Spirit. Forgive me for the Lord Jesus Christ. I have a Father, and Spirit. I be. <clears throat> okay, guys. Uh, White Sox fan, right here. Yeah. yeah, I got no skeletons yet. If this is going to distract you, let me know. But I think it actually adds a little flavor, doesn't it? What's up, Anna Groon? I still don't know. No, I'm not a Sox fan. It's just a shirt I'm wearing because it's nice and it makes me look skinnier. Because I still, I'm not where I need to be. I know in Jesus' name, I will attain my goal physically, lose that weight, keep it off, be healthy by his grace. But more importantly, he will give me grace to be holy and pure and righteous and in love with Jesus Christ by my deeds, not just my words. To be a doer and not struggle and succumb to my sinful passions. Please, Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit. I bid. Uh, Ryan, this is not all my books. Ryan, if I tell you my story, you'll cry with me. And you'll cry for me. You'll cry with me and you'll cry for me. Guys, remember, I'm not connected to the router modem. But praise the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> The internet connection has been fabulous. Pray it stays fabulous because right now I'm in a room so that I don't disturb my neighbors. I'm close to the street, balconies right here, and the connection has been fabulous. Thank the Lord Jesus for his grace and mercy. Ryan, I'm going to let you cry. You want to cry a little bit? I have, yep, I lost the book on the Orthodox Church. I need to find it or buy it. I have, no exaggeration, over 20 boxes of books 95% of which are theological books, but I don't have access to them. Most of my books are in a Christian center. A godly pastor, Pastor Sam, and the goodness of his heart allowed me to put my boxes there in Chicago. The other boxes are in storage in Illinois I don't have access to. And the reason why I don't have access to them is because of that bitter divorce and God have mercy on my ex-wife and forgive her. When she got me out of my home, she barred me from my books. And so she used her boyfriend to take my books and put them in storage. And I never got the key. So now I have to pay every month storage fees for books in another state that I don't have access to. Lord Jesus, have mercy on her and forgive her. Folks, if she repents and fears Jesus and gets right with Christ, all of this damage will be undone. So... God is a God of the miraculous, and he loves her. The Lord Jesus died for her salvation. Pray the Lord Jesus will convict her. The Holy Spirit will be a fire in her heart to repent and turn to Jesus Christ. Because if she does turn to Christ, all of this damage she'll undo. So I don't have access to my books. Honestly, I don't. I have books that I have not read. Most of the books I haven't read. So what I do is I collect books for future reference. It's like a reference library so i'll get a book and i'll put it in my shelf and then if a topic comes up i'll go and consult the book to see what that book says you know i'll either cite from it or try to refute it so that's where i'm at and so it's disheartening when i listen to youtube shows and people reference books that are in my library that i want to check to verify and i can't because i'm not going to spend money on books anymore i I can't afford it. I mean, man, I got too many books as it is. Yeah, but a lot of these books are not on the Internet, Niles. They're not on the Internet. Now, folks, again, my apologies. If you're wondering why I'm starting a little later than usual, I'm trying, by the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, to have a consistent schedule. So this is the consistent schedule. I'll try to live stream once every day unless something comes up, and I will aim for either f uh, 3 p.m. or 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 3 p.m. or 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, God willing. That will be what I want <clears throat> to shoot for. That will be the schedule, and I want to stay with it. But then things come up. Things happen. Things either happen, and as I tell you, we're all in a battle. It's spiritual warfare. So there are days in which I get up, and I feel... How do I say I feel stressed, I feel oppressed, I feel sad, depressed, right? And then my carnal 
fleshly desires kick in. And so some days are easier, some days are harder. But I'm trusting the Holy Spirit. And let me remind you again, I know this is going to sound weird, but those of you born of the Spirit can identify. Even on those days where I feel lonely because I don't have, let's say, my children, or sad and depressed, or angry and, and disappointed at the way things have turned out, partly because of the sins of others and my own sins and failures, there's still a joy and a peace and a love and a calmness that fills me that I know it's not from me, it's from the Holy Spirit. And that's the grace of Jesus Christ that in spite of your battles, he's there to sustain you and fill you with his peace and love and joy. And he's a patient God who in his love and mercy <clears throat> patiently works with us and through us to become more like Jesus in holiness and purity, and that even when we fail, he is merciful to forgive. So, so that's what happened. So today was a little harder, you know, but glory to God, I'm here. And so that's why I'm now live streaming. It's 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Because I was going to go on earlier, but then our precious brother and the Lord Jesus Al-Fadi had a live stream with Ratish Matthew. So I didn't want to live stream while he's live streaming because I don't like to do that. When we have brothers and sisters live streaming, I don't want to live stream because we're not in competition. They're not in competition with me. I'm not in competition with them. We all are part of the same family of God, brothers and sisters seeking to glorify Jesus Christ. So well, I wanted to wait for him to finish. So I hope you understand, but I'm going to try to be consistent and do it around 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Eastern Standard Time, that would be New York time. So about a grace of God. And I'm impressed today. I'm impressed to myself. I mean, I'm looking at the screen, unless the screen is deceiving me. Glory to God, it looks like I'm leaner than before, and I'm much more handsome. In fact, I'm so handsome, I want to ask myself out. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Shimon. Are you dating anyone? No idea. With that said, <clears throat> you guys ready? Are you in the saddle? Come on, folks. I want to see over 200. Glory to God. I want to see over 300 sooner than later. It's not so much the numbers, but it is because I want more quality individuals to learn this stuff, to use it for the glory of Christ. And thank the mods for helping me to help you. Thank Protestant <clears throat> Believer, this man is a blessing from the Lord. He's got a family and he works, and yet he sacrifices his own time and he doesn't get paid to beatify the YouTube channel, to put these amazing thumbnails, some amazing pictures he finds, and he's working on editing some of these videos, and he's doing it out of his love for Jesus, free of charge. I don't pay him. In fact, I'm, I'm a thorn in his side, right? And yet he tolerates me for the sake of the Lord. You know that's the grace of Jesus, right? So praise his holy name. So folks, please pray for them and do me a favor. Please, brethren, covenant with me to pray and fast and ask your churches to pray and fast for my daughters and I, that Jesus Christ the Lord will miraculously protect them and me, give me favor, divine favor in this area, to stay planted here, to save me from corrupt, evil <clears throat> individuals who abuse and misuse their authority right and that the lord jesus will continue to purify me for his glory and make me holy for the glory of christ and provide for the ministry and to be a man of integrity pray i am a man of integrity not to prostitute myself for fame or money so that said father have mercy and forgive us lord abba forgive us father forgive me especially when i fail you have mercy on us father Father, we want to love you perfectly, yet we fail. Have mercy on us for the sake of Jesus, your son. We love you, Babi. We love you, Avinu. And Father, please give me the grace to show you my love by my deeds, not just my, my words. We are in love with your son, the Lord Jesus, and help us to walk as Jesus walked, conform to his, to his image by the power of your beautiful Holy Spirit. And we love your Holy Spirit, without whom we could not, as much as we fail, Without your Holy Spirit, we completely fail and plunge to the depth of sin and depravity. We need your Holy Spirit and fill us. Crucify our flesh. Save us from the stains of our own flesh and our wickedness, Father.
Purify us in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, your very heart that became flesh, and seal us by your spirit. And Father, bless this session. Bless the internet connection. Bless your household. Those who are gathering, bring more, Father. Use me by the Spirit to recall the scriptures perfectly, not to <clears throat> misquote them, misinterpret them, or forget them, and give us the power to live them out, to live your word perfectly, Father. And Father, give us hearts filled with love, passionate love for you, for the Lord Jesus, for the Spirit, and to have passionate love for one another, even for our enemies. Help me, Father, in that area I'm weak, to forgive and hold no grudges, Father. Please make us more like Jesus. Please, Bobby. Please, Avinu. Please, Abba, for the sake of Jesus. And fill my chest and my lungs and throat with the breath of life. And perfect my sight spiritually and physically. To use my sight to study the word and to see things the way you see it. And bless your people, Father. Fill them with wisdom and knowledge, understanding from your spirit, Father. Bless the babes and make them spiritually mature men and women in Christ. And bless those who are mature to become more mature. Make me more mature in holiness and purity and love and worship and devotion. And make us holy soldiers and warriors for Jesus Christ in the spiritual battle to destroy the kingdom of Satan by the blood of Jesus as our covering with the sword of the Spirit and the weapons that you have given us. And take captive every mind and thought for the glory of Jesus. Destroy atheism and agnosticism and secularism and all these false religions. Because Christ reigns and he is life, he is real, he is risen. And creation belongs to him. Make us ambassadors of Christ to take captive what belongs to him for his glory. Bless this session, Father. Please, Lord. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on me, Lord. Give me the power to be self-controlled, self-disciplined, to exercise perfect self-restraint. Give us grace to be spiritually disciplined and physically disciplined and to be pure. Please, Father. And Father, please, I ask. There are single men and women here who struggle with passions. Father, please constrain our passions never to defile ourselves until we get married to that person that you have set apart for us, Father. You know the needs. Father, these young men, bring them godly women. These young women who love Jesus, bring them godly men and unite them and keep us pure until that happens, Father, for the glory of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to never shame Jesus. And, Father, I also pray for Brian Anthony's father. Have mercy on him. Give him perfect healing and recovery, Father. Please, in Jesus' name, bless his father, Lord, and fill him with the Spirit. Please, Abba, we need you. Lord Jesus, we need you. Holy Spirit, we need you. We love you, Bobby. We love you, Son of God. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yahweh, Father, Son of Spirit. Yahweh, Father, Son of Spirit. Yahweh, Father, Son of Spirit. Anna, I still have our time pronouncing your last name, man. It's a, it's I don't know if it's Groong, Grung, right? But folks, let me encourage you. If God has not called you to the celibate life, seek God's face for your godly spouse. Seek God's face now. Say, God, please reveal that man for me. If you're a sister, reveal that woman for me. If you're a brother, reveal them sooner than later in Jesus' name. Now, you have a lot of single people here who love Jesus. Number one criteria, marriage is going to be difficult, but I'll tell you what. If you find someone that loves Jesus Christ more than anything, then your marriage will last by the power and grace of Jesus Christ. Okay? And we have a lot of single men and women. I'm going to just name a few brothers that I think are a catch from what I see. And I don't think they're fake. You got Ariel Gonzalez, who loves Jesus, and he's an apologist. Alan Ruhl, who loves Jesus, and he's an apologist. Daniel Julius, among the brothers. And we have sisters who love the Lord who are single, right? Hatsa, uh, Anna. Who else do we have here? I don't want to leave. And Christos Anessi is a brother, right? Yeah, some people will be called to singleness. Some people, yeah, Vino, I, Vino Thomas, yes. Now, those of you who are single, it doesn't hurt to speak to each other. Contact each other on Facebook, social media. Get to speak as brothers and sisters and see if God will have you come together. Right? Come on now. What do you think you're going to find a godly person? You're going to find them in the gatherings of believers. Right? 
You may find them in a supermarket, but you know that would be really a miraculous act of God. But what are you going to find? But be careful. You also find wolves in sheep's clothing. And until church is open, social media, now we're gathering, gathering a boy, Mary Magdalene. She is a beautiful, godly sister, loves Jesus, and she has two beautiful daughters. Yes, she's an Akatu. I don't know if she's here because you mentioned Magdalene. So, guys, get to talk to each other. Reach, and But remember, you are not of the world. Before I begin, let me just encourage you. You're not of the world. You don't date like the world. You don't approach women like men in the world do. You re reach your sisters in Christ with respect and honor and dignity because they are daughters of the living God. They are purchased by the blood of Jesus. They are sealed by the Spirit, and they're destined to be queens to reign with Jesus Christ. There is no premarital sex. Ask God to give you grace and power, because I know that's hard, man. I know it is. Believe me, I know. I struggle, but for the sake of Jesus, say, please, Holy Spirit, constrain me. I trust in you to constrain me. I don't trust me. Honor them. Honor them, because Jesus purchased them to be daughters of his father, to be his sisters who will reign with him. Honor them. Honor them, right? And so if you do find someone that you may think is of the Lord, reach out because you know why? Let me tell you something. Women don't like to be the ones who reach out to the men because chivalry is not dead. They want the man to pursue them. And if they're godly women, they want a godly man to pursue them. But sisters, let me tell you something. And I just, I don't know why I feel that to talk about this. Because I care about you guys. I may not love you perfectly. You know, because I lose my testimony and temper with you. Let me tell you something, women. There are men here who love Jesus, but they're not of the world. So they know they can't play game games and they cannot, you know, be slick talkers and try to sweep you off your feet. And many of these men feel intimidated approaching you sisters. I know. I know many of them. Yeah, I hope it is, Ariel, because I'm concerned for you guys. You know, if you're of the Lord Jesus, and you are, and God hasn't called you to celibacy, but all I'm going to tell you, i am letting you know I'm a man, and I'm telling you from an insider's perspective. When men are born of the Spirit, something changes. If we're in the world, we're like dogs. And so we act like dogs and we pursue women like dogs because we don't care. But in Christ, it changes. Now we realize, man, I can't be like that anymore. I got to be very careful what I say to a sister. And maybe this sister loves the Lord may not be drawn to me because I may not be spiritual enough for her. And so it puts a fear in the hearts of men to approach godly women. Say, look, the men are agreeing with me. You see that? Did you catch it? See the men? So sisters... There may be men who find you beautiful because they see your love for Jesus, but they're afraid to approach you because it's not the world. We're not in the world. We cannot be dogs who pursue you like dogs because you're a piece of meat, because you're not a piece of meat. And we know things have changed. Hold on. Jesus lives. He lives in me, and he's watching me. So I can't play that game. I can't be that player I was in the world because this is a sister of the Lord, purchased by Christ. She's a queen, a daughter of God. So I got to be careful. So, And first and last is also single. Yes, I, Christian, brother, if you were to find a godly woman sold out for Jesus, it'd be different. But <laughs> We didn't find that. <laughs> you mean didn't find that, bro? So, men, can you amen that? Am I lying? Yeah, Riaz, too. Am I lying when I said... There's a fear and hesitance on your part to maybe approach a sister in Christ. So women, take the hint. Hint, hint. I know you want to be romanced by a godly man, but godly men have a different mindset. Oh, man, maybe if I pursue her, she may get offended. She may not like me. She may then think I'm not a Christian, and she may think I'm still a dog in the world. And you know what? Forget about it. And so they continue to grow. Okay. See, now Magdalene says, be brave. Easier said than done, Magdalene, especially for those who've been damaged and gone through bad experiences and bad relationships. Lord have mercy. Now, if we're ready, if we're in the saddle, 
and ready to go, let's begin. In modern day, it's especially hard because if you approach it, oh, yeah. <laughs> Sparky, tell me about it. Even Ariel said, like the Me Too movement. <laughs> Man, tell me about it. Okay. So, folks, I pray if that's from the Spirit, he'll bless that and put you. Because I see a lot of single men and women who love Jesus, right, who love Jesus. And they're still single because there's a fear. Women don't like to pursue men. They want men to pursue them. Men are afraid to pursue women in Christ because they know I'm not that person anymore. I'm not that player in the world. In the world, I didn't care what women thought. I was a dog. Nah, I can't be that anymore. So keep that in mind. So are we ready? Are we ready? Who's ready? Everyone here? Is Luisa here, my sister too? Sorry, I'm going to try to keep it at between 3 and 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But things happen, folks. Folks, as we begin, just remember, I am broken. I am tainted by sin. I struggle with sin, sinful, carnal desires. I struggle with disappointment and anger. I, too, am a broken vessel who needs the great physician, Jesus, to heal me of my own filth and flesh to make me brand new and refresh me daily. And some days it's harder than others. One of those days that was hard was today. I woke up just feeling, feeling, you know, Lord, honestly, let me just say this real quick. I said, Lord, you know, who, who am I kidding? I'm, I'm not. I'm a fake. I disappoint you daily and I grieve the Holy Spirit, which I don't want to. And I don't want to shame you. I don't want to ever disgrace the name of Christ. I don't ever want to do something scandalous to dishonor you. You know, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm just not good. You know, so these are, those are days. One of, today was one of them. So I asked the Holy Spirit, if I am called to ministry, and if you have set me apart to glorify Christ till I die, which is, that's what I want. I want to glorify Jesus till I die. Then Holy Spirit, heal me. I'm broken. Heal me. Heal me to be like Jesus and love like Jesus and lay my life down even for my enemies. So, so don't think we apologists, don't think we apologists don't struggle. We all struggle. We have issues, right? So with that said, Protestant, you here? You here, brother? Let's begin. We're going to continue where we left off, and I want to answer another objection that came up. I challenged the man to call me power of none. Zina, how are you, sister? Lord bless you, sister. Here's another one. Now, Zina, let me not speak presumptuously. I may not know because I've just seen you. From what I gather, you left Islam, you're in love with Jesus, and you want to be on fire for Jesus. Am I correct? You may be single. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm on the wheel. So I'm playing the matchmaker for everyone. Oh, guys, you got a sister in the Lord who's another sister who's single. Left Islam for Jesus. She's in love with Jesus. And I'm pretty certain she's not called to be a nun. Am I correct? Are you called to be a nun? You're going to break a lot of hearts if you're called to be a nun. Oh, okay. Are you still considering it? So then you're off limits. Are you still considering being a nun or you're... You're open to finding a godly man who loves Jesus. Sydney, to you too, sister. We have another one because I mentioned those are single. Yeah. I don't know. If you are open to finding a godly man who loves Jesus, guys, here's another one. Zina. Brat et Mshicha too. But remember, Brat et Mshicha, she's a Syrian. And being a Syrian, she beats people into repentance. So you got to be careful there, right? She'll beat you down into repentance, and then she will hug you and love you and affirm you. Okay, Zena, if the Lord is pleased to lead you to marriage, may you find that godly man. So guys, pray, say, Lord, make it me, please. And by the way, they have a song about Zena. Hey, Zena, what a kind of fina. I think it's a Moroccan song, by the way. Hold on. It's only six in me. Let me see. Hold on. Can I find it? Let me see if I find that song. 
You know what I'm talking about? By, you know, by the way, they send me emails every time I play a song or a clip from YouTube, I get a notification saying, oh, yeah, copyright. But don't worry about it. We're not going to remove your video. Here, let me show you. This is a nice song here. Let's see. Here it goes. Okay. This is from Spotify, YouTube. It's from Spotify. You marani maak, adwa thani mutmini. Yiktab bil mktoob, wankoon hadak. Ah ya qalbi shuf hawak, wila ramani. Bukb har safi, bmuajudani maah. Tabari ah al hub, wandk hatani, wadani. وصاني وقلي حبيبك ما تنساه تيسينا ما درتي فينا أنا وقلبي وزنا لك ما لقينا يا سينا ما درتي فينا أنا وقلبي Wow, what a great spot song from Spotify. What a great song from Spotify. No copyright infringement. All right. There you go. We have another sister here also. She's an Assyrian warrior. Her name is Zina too. Zina, I just gave you the link. Here it goes. See, now Zina got excited. There's a song written about her. We have another sister who's my mod. Her, uh, her name is Zina too. By the way, I know Kelbi means my heart, right? But in my language, it means my dog. So I don't know what he was saying. Was he saying my dog or my heart? That's for you to decide, right? That's for you to decide. Okay, now, guys, you realize you got a lot of single men who love Jesus, single women love Jesus. Start connecting. Start praying. Reach out. You don't know. Don't be shy. Get a little closer. Don't be shy. All right. That's it. Let's begin. Okay. In Jesus' name, may he be glorified. I'm going to continue to unpack why Hebrews 1.5, in fact, the entire chapter of Hebrews, is a nightmare for Jehovah's Witnesses and Unitarians. In fact, Ariel caught it yesterday. It's like a light switch went on by the grace of God's Spirit. He sees how the proper interpretation of Hebrews 1, let me just be honest and not politically correct, decimates Unitarianism and Jehovah's Witnesses. Decimate. Thank you, Sam Drew. I appreciate it, man. Will he burn me? Sam Drew, do you want to sit and listen to the session? You're more than welcome to stay and listen, as long as you don't mock and blaspheme. And I'll show you respect. Sam Drew, you want to stay? Will you not attack and mock? So I don't attack and mock in return. Sam Drew. Just want to make sure, because he said Allah will burn me. All right. Well, if Allah is the true God, yeah, he'll burn me. If not, I pray Jesus saves you. So you want to sit and listen? Can you control yourself and not attack and mock and blaspheme so I don't have to attack you? Because I just want you to sit and listen, even if you disagree. So can you listen, Sam Drew? Because obviously you came here. Hold on. I want to see if this man will be able to sit here and listen. I, I just, I don't know. You know, I love you, right, brother? How is he going to respond to me if you just put him, put him on timeout for 306 seconds? I love you, Alan. I love you, man. Alan, I love you, man. I really do, brother. Anyway, let's begin. Oh, no matter. Oh, he said he wouldn't. I thought he said, no, I won't attack. But anyway, let's begin. I love you, Alan. All right. Yep. Now, with that said, let's unpack Hebrews 1. Let's go back to Hebrews 1, 5. By the way, here are the articles again. Please. Click on the links, please. Click on the links. Save the article, study them. It does you no good if you don't study them and then pass it on to others. Here's the first article, okay? I'm going to give you two articles on this particular subject, all right? Two articles on this particular subject. Here's the second article. 
because that, most of the information, if not all of it, will be in these articles. Uh, Bay, are you are you upset that I waste so much time on non-important issues? Can you tell me if it's upsetting you? No, no, hold on, no. Is, are you getting angry? Because you know I'm going to do to you right now, right? Don't block him yet. Just tell me you're so upset that I take my sweet time and you can't stand it because I know what to do with you. Please make my day, punk. Go ahead. Make my day, punk. See, I'm sounding like Clint Eastwood. Is it upsetting you, sweetie? There, there, baby. Oh, I'm sorry, sweetie. Mommy didn't take care of you. She didn't burp you. She didn't change your diaper, sweetie. All right. Hebrews 1, verse 5. Yeah, do you feel lucky, punk? Magdalene, hopefully I don't live you. Hopefully I love you. But you scared me. You go, Sam lives us. Hope I don't live you, but love you. Okay, Hebrews 1.5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now, don't forget, folks, if you're not listening to the previous sessions, this is not going to make sense. This is why now this is the fourth session on this topic. This is now part four. Please, for the glory of Christ, re-listen, re-re-listen until the material becomes second nature. Because I don't want to repeat the same things I already covered in the previous sessions. I already demonstrated what type of sonship Hebrews 1.5 has in mind. I hope the noise is not bothering you. If it is, I'll put a, a plug in. Okay. okay. Send Bay to his mommy. Sorry, baby. Bay, come here, Bay. Oh, was that big, old, bald man a meanie to you? Sorry. Burp, burp, burp. All right. Focusing. If you recall the type of sonship that Hebrews 1.5 has in mind, and I gave you the material in the previous sessions. I gave you the material in the previous sessions. has to do with what I call royal sonship. What do I mean by royal sonship? When God covenanted with David, made a covenant with David, the covenant of David entailed the following. You, David, and your heirs, from your physical lineage will sit on my throne on earth in Jerusalem and the day in which you sit to rule then you become my son I've given the evidence it's irrefutable exegetically it's irrefutable this is what the Bible teaches so when David took the throne to reign in Zion in Jerusalem that day he became God's son so the term I use is called Royal sonship. Israel's king as God's son. Now, why did God beget him spiritually on the day of his coronation? Because God is a spiritual being. He does not beget physically or sexually. He begets children spiritually without sex. Why? Because a son is supposed to resemble his father and carry on the work of his father. So the reason why the kings became God's sons on the day they began ruling is because they're called to resemble God's character and rule in heaven. As God rules in heaven and the way he rules, these earthly kings are supposed to reflect the way God rules in heaven on earth. So they are his sons in that they're called to resemble the character of God and God's rule. Because what is a son? A son is someone who bears resemblance to his father, who's the image of his father, who's supposed to <clears throat> reflect his father and honor his father and carry the work of his father. Is that clear? Is that clear before I move on? Because we're going to go into some meat. Before, If you're not getting it, say, Sam, can you repeat so I can get the point? So that kind of sonship was given only to David and his sons who would take the throne from him. Not to all of David's sons. Only the sons of David that took the throne. What's up, Frank? I never turned to you, Frank. Good to see you, brother. God bless you. Another dear brother to my heart. You know, I love him, but not too much. You know, love him enough, but not that much. 
So this was only true of anyone who came from David's line to sit on the throne in the place of David. So this wasn't true of Absalom, David's son, right? It was true of Solomon who took the throne. And then it became true of Rehoboam, Solomon's son, and so on and so forth. Now, this type of sonship God has never granted to any angelic creature. That's the point of Hebrews 1. The point of Hebrews 1 is this kind of sonship was not given to angelic creatures. God never granted any angelic creature to sit on the throne that he gave to David, right? As the heir of the promises that he made to David. What's the point? Hebrews 1 says that Jesus does sit on the throne of David as David's heir, a blessing that God did not give to any angelic creature. Well, Jehovah Witness, I'm confused. According to you, Jesus is not human in heaven. He's an archangel, the archangel Michael. But the argument in Hebrews says he can't be an angel if he's the heir of David. He must be a physical human being in heaven and still a physical descendant of David in heaven. Otherwise, you end up having Hebrews contradicting the very point that the author was trying to make. You see the problem now. You see now how this destroys Joe's witnesses? And is Jesus still a physical human being and still a physical descendant of David now in heaven in glory? Yes, Revelation 22, verse 16. And then I'm going to explain the different types of sonships in the Bible. Revelation 22, verse 16. If you get this argument, it's over for Joe's witnesses. If after this, someone hears this and still wants to be a Joe witness, then that person is blind and demonized and deserves the discipline that God will bring upon him or her. Because you're now contradicting Hebrews and you're turning the argument of Hebrews upside down on its head. But if you want proof that Jesus is still a physical human being, and still a physical descendant of David in heaven right now in glory. There you go. Revelation 22, verse 16. Notice what our Lord says. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. Who's speaking? I, Jesus. Right? I am right now as I speak to you, John, in heaven. I am. Not I was. I am right now the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Hold on. Lord, I can understand how you're the root of David, meaning you're the foundation of David's life, his dynasty, his existence, because life comes from you. So David's life comes from you. The dynastic promises come from you. Their fulfillment come from you. But how are you still, how are you still the descendant of David in heaven if you're not still human? You get the point? Because that's what he said. I'm not just his root right now. I am his offspring, his descendant. So Hebrews 1, consistent with the Bible, consistent with Revelation, shows Jesus cannot be an angelic creature. Joe's Witnesses, your religion is over. Game over. Gig is up. Close down the watchtower. Repent and give your life to Jehovah Jesus. Your religion has been destroyed just by Hebrews 1. If you understand the interpretation of Hebrews 1, it's over for Joe's witnesses. You know that, right? That one chapter inspired by the Spirit, it almost seems like the Spirit deliberately inspired that chapter because he saw the coming of heretics like Joe's witnesses. Did you get it? Now, let's talk about the different kinds of sonships in the Bible. Because angels are the sons of God in a different sense. Now, here's where I need you to really pay attention because I'm going to unpack this meat, right? But Philo will put me in a pickle. You're right about that. Philo didn't say much about this. I'm now in a pickle because Philo, there is no God but God, and Philo is his uninspired messenger. Shepherd's ambassador. 
you have my permission to take all my articles, turn them into videos. You have my permission to upload my articles and my videos and make portions out of them. You don't need to ask. This is for the glory of Jesus. And if you're a Trinitarian glorifying Jesus, you have my permission, Shepherd's Ambassador. Go for it. All right? You have my permission. Now, here you're going to learn a little bit about the way the Bible defines the term Son of God and in the various ways in which God is depicted as a father. Are you ready? Because now we're going to seminary. Let me be humble. We're not going to seminary. I wouldn't last in seminary. They throw me out the first week. Oh, there we go again. Why do these guys come to my channel? They don't like me and my teaching and my approach. Can you ask me why they can't stay away from me? Why can't they stay away from me? Okay, I'm rude, unkind. Why are you? <laughs> if I don't like someone, I ignore them. Like Frank Khoshaba. When I see him, I make sure to take off if I'm in a car 100 miles per hour to avoid him like the plague. I don't like the guy. So I avoid him. So why do they come to my channel? Man, I don't get it. All right. All right. Now, with that said, with that said, angels are the sons of God in a different sense. Israel is God's son in a different sense. So let me explain. Guys, really, I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit you get this. David was already a son of God in one sense before he became the king of Israel. As part of the covenant community, the nation of Israel, being an Israelite, David was already a son of God. Deuteronomy 14, verse 1. Now you're going to learn the Bible uses the language children of God, sons of God, and defines God's fatherhood in different ways, in different senses, in different contexts. Here, Deuteronomy 14, verse 1. You are the sons of the Lord your God, talking to the Israelites. You shall not cut yourselves or make any baldness on your foreheads for the dead. So notice the nation, the Israelites, were already the sons of God by the covenant that God made with them. He was already their father. You got that? Exodus 4, 22 to 23. I was just watching my debate with Stephen Ritchie. And in the cross-examination, I kept saying Jeremiah 17, verse 9, when I meant Jeremiah 17, 10, and I was upset. Lord Jesus, protect me from error and misquoting scripture. I was so upset. I meant Jeremiah 17, 10, and I kept saying Jeremiah 17, 9. Maybe that was prophetic, talking about his evil heart. That is an older debate, Car uh, Car uh, Carly Walker. Now, pay attention here. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says Jehovah the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. Now, folks, can I ask you a question? Are you ready now to learn and go in depth? Um, I don't want to bore you, but I don't necessarily want to make this an entertainment session. I wanted to make it a theological session where we unpack the meat of scripture and go deep and educate ourselves about the beauty and majesty and the tapestry of the Bible. Okay. Now, pay attention. If the entire nation of Israelites were set apart to be the sons and daughters of God, doesn't that mean that David, before he became the king of Israel, was already a son of God? Doesn't that mean that Solomon, before he became the king of Israel, was already a son of God by virtue of being an Israelite and part of the covenant community? You see how it's working now? So notice, David was already God's son in one sense, but became God's son in a different sense. You see how it's working? Is it making sense? You getting it? Just like Jesus Christ was already the Son of God in one sense, but became God's Son in a different sense. Ah, bingo. Jesus was already the Son of God in one sense before he became God's Son in that other sense that Hebrews 1 is mentioning. Ching, the light switch went on. All glory to the Holy Spirit. Catching it? 
So notice, Jesus as God is the eternal son. Jesus as an Israelite becomes God's son in that sense. The moment Jesus becomes an Israelite, part of the community, he becomes a son of God covenantally by being an Israelite. So the eternal son becomes an Israelite. And as an Israelite, he's now part of the covenant community. And as part of that community, he now becomes a son of God in that sense that the nation is. And then later he becomes a royal son. Do you see how many ways in which Jesus is God's son? Do you see? So that's where the discerning Trinitarian has to read the text and say, is it now talking about Jesus as God's son covenantally as part of the nation or as God's son being the heir of David, so he's the royal son, or God's son by virtue of his divine nature? You see how it works? Exactly. You see how it's working? Deuteronomy 32, verse 6. Exactly, or I'm about to get to there too. Deuteronomy 32, verse 6. We're going to go deep. Deuteronomy 32, verse 6. Hopefully, yeah, Zina, help me to help you make sure you're getting it. Do you thus repay the Lord, Jehovah, you foolish and senseless people? Is not he your father? So if you're an Israelite, God is already your father at that time, covenantally. Who created you? Who made you and established you? So notice. In what sense is Jehovah Israel's father? He is their father in that he created the nation and set them apart to be his special people on earth, representing him to the other nations. Is it making sense? I'm going to educate you by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to go deep. That's why I was getting attacked this morning with depression and just, you know, fleshly desires because Satan wants to take me out. He really does, folks. He really wants to take me out. And if you're not praying for miraculous protection, right, I need the Lord to protect me. Yes, covenantally, meaning that God made a covenant with Israel. You'll be my people on earth. You will be the nation that I will work through to bring all the other nations to salvation. I'm going to set you apart to be my people so that the other nations will see you and see that you're different, so different that they'll realize the reason why they're not like us is because their God is not like our gods. And we want to worship their God because this people stands out. What makes you different? What makes you special? And Israel kept dropping the ball. Instead of Israel shining as a light, for the nations to say, look, we're different from you. We don't eat like you. We don't worship like you. We don't speak like you. We don't dress like you. We don't in, in, indulge in your abominable practices, your sexual immoral practices. Do you know why? Because our God is unlike your gods. So come on over. But you know what they did? They kept running to their gods. Hey, we like your God more than our God. We and shaming the Lord. And God says, this is not why I established you. I established you and set you apart so that people can see the difference between you and them and realize the reason why you're different is because your God is different to move them to want to worship me and abandon their gods. But every time you run to their gods, you shame me and dishonor me because that's a message to them. That I'm no better than their gods. In fact, their gods are better than me. That's the message you're sending to them. You get it? You see what the Lord is saying? Exodus 19 verses 4 to 6. To see this is why God set them apart. He didn't set them apart because he didn't love the nations. He set them apart because he loved the nations. Because it was through them he was going to bring the nations to saving faith in him. But Israel kept shaming him. No, Andy, I'm not going to change the subject for you. Don't ask me about a passage that's not related to the topic. You're disrespecting me. Focus. Exodus 19, 4 to 6. Watch here. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now read 5 to 6. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, 
You shall be my treasured possession among all peace, peoples, for all the earth is mine. I own everything and everyone on the earth, but I set you apart. Why? Here's the key. Verse 6. Here's why. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of God of Israel. Folks, you know what priests do? They intercede. If the entire nation of Israel are priests, that means that nation was called to intercede for the nation surrounding them and be a light to them because they're holy, separate, to bring them to saving faith in God. And they failed. And they failed. Did you catch it now? Are you learning now? Do you see? So God didn't set, separate Israel because he didn't love the nations. He separated them because he loved the nations. Because he was going to work through this group of individuals. I'm going to work through you. I'm going to set you apart. I'm going to make you eat differently, dress differently, look differently, worship differently to move them to jealousy so they want to then worship your God. But they failed. So in what sense was Israel the son of God? In the sense that God created that nation to be his vehicle on earth to move other nations to want to worship the God of Israel and abandon their gods. So they are God's son in the sense that they're called to resemble God, reflect God, in order to move other nations to want to worship their God. And they failed. So let me ask you again, because we're going to go in depth on this topic. Okay, let me ask you again. If David is an Israelite and Solomon is an Israelite, Jesus is an Israelite, aren't they already the sons of God by virtue of being an Israelite, part of that community, that covenant community that God covenanted with to set them apart as his sons and daughters to reflect them to the nations? But then David becomes a different kind of son, God's royal son. Solomon becomes a different kind of son. God's royal son. So notice how this applies to Jesus. Pay attention. How it applies to you. The eternal son becomes an Israelite. And now he becomes God's son in that sense. And then later he takes the throne of David and then becomes God's son in that sense. So there are three senses in which Jesus is God's son. Eternal, covenantally as a community, and the royal son. Sinking in? Making sense? So when you talk about Jesus as the Son of God, in what sense? The eternal Son by virtue of being God? The Son of God by virtue of being part of the covenant community? Because all the sons and daughters of Israel are the sons and daughters of God? The royal Son by virtue of being a Davidic descendant and the heir of David who took the throne on David's behalf? He's the Son of God in all those senses. But there's one type of sonship which separates him, one type of sonship that separates him and makes him utterly unique and unlike all the other sons and daughters of God. His eternal sonship. As God, he's the eternal son, and he is uncreated and infinitely greater than all creation. That type of sonship is unique to Christ alone. No other son of God is like Jesus in regards to that kind of sonship. He is the one who makes God a father. Like your firstborn makes you a parent. Jesus is God's firstborn in that he is the one that makes God a father. But since God has always been a father, Jesus has always been the firstborn. Exactly. And all sonships are supposed to reflect that son whose image we bear and are created in. Amazing. Thank you, Tatiana. All right. People said it's okay, Tatiana. They said they loved it. 
By the way, Tatiana is another Assyrian warrior for Jesus. Pray for her and her children that the Lord Jesus blesses her. I'm sorry, Tatiana, people, but you can hear an echo now, right? Now you can hear an echo. All right. Yeah, pray for our sister. She's a warrior, a lioness for Jesus. Pray God bless her and her children. Is the echo bothering you guys? Is the echo bothering you or are you guys okay? Exactly, Rode. You got it. The eternal son made us all sons. You got it, Rode. Kiss your head, baby. You got it. Okay, now follow with me because I'm going to have to do several more sessions. You know I'm not going to be able to finish this in one session. I'm trying to give you the depth of scripture so you walk away blown by the beauty and the tapestry of the scriptures and how beautiful the God of the scriptures truly is. Oh, thank you, DJ. Appreciate it, brother. Okay. Now, so you have sonship defined differently depending on the context. Now, in what sense? Well, before I even go to the angels. Yeah, before I go to the angels, yeah. Let's go to Acts 17, 24 to 28, specifically verse 28. Thank you, George, because you're epic. Okay, Acts 17, 24 to 28. I'll go to the angels a little later. Acts 17, 24 to 28. Guys, read this with me so you can understand. There's a sense in which every creature is a son or daughter of God. Did you know that? Every creature is a son or daughter of God. Even Satan. Ooh, I shocked you. Even Satan is a son of God. What? Oh, hold on. Acts 17, 24, 28. Here it is. To prove my point, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, the God who created all the world. He's the Lord of heaven and earth, sovereign over heaven and earth. Heaven and earth does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives to all mankind, every human being receives life from this God and breath and everything necessary for life comes from this God, the God I'm proclaiming. Okay. And he made from one man, literally from one blood, he made from one blood every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. God willing, I'll explain that later. So I want to focus on sonship here. Notice 27. Read with me in 27. Watch here. <clears throat> that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. Notice 28, the key. For in him we live and move and have our being. In him we exist because of him. We breathe and have life because of him. The necessities of life, the things we need to live, come from him. We exist because he gives us life, sustains us, and nourishes us because he made us. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. So now notice what Paul is saying. God is father in the sense that he created the entire creation. He gives life to the entire creation and he gives nourishment to the entire creation. So notice fatherhood here is defined as the one who gives life and sustains life. Right? Is that clear? Before I move on. That's how he defined it. He made the heavens and the earth. He made the world, everything in it. He owns everything. He made all the nations from one blood. And it's in him we live and move and have our being. And he gives us breath and light. You understand what that means? If God made you, you are his child. He's your father in that sense. Now, folks, did he make the angels? Does he sustain the angels? Does he give life to the angels? Then you just admit the angels are his sons too. Voila. Now you see why the angels are called the sons of God. Voila. So there's a sense in which angels are the sons of God. Not in the sense that Israel's God's son. Not in the sense that David and his heirs are God's sons. Not in the sense that born again believers are God's sons. But they are the sons of God in a certain sense. It now makes sense, doesn't it? Is 
Is it sinking in before I move on? But now let me trouble you a little bit. <laughs> no matter what you do, I'm going crazy. Uh, did God create Satan before he became evil? God didn't create Satan to be evil. Satan corrupted himself and became evil. Did God create Satan? Is God sustaining Satan? Is God sustaining Satan? Then you just admit Satan is also a son of God, but a rebellious one. Satan is a rebellious son of God. <whistles> no matter what you do, I'm going crazy. I'd rather be alone. The evil spirits that work with Satan, did God create them? Not to be evil, they corrupted themselves. Did he create them? Yes. Does he sustain them? Yes. Well, in creating and sustaining them, they too are his sons. Do you really want me to go deeper and... Trouble you a little more to make you think out of the box? So, Brian, God did not create Satan. No, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. Do you want me to really bother you and stretch you and think out? And, guys, please, before you attack me, I'm not saying believe what I believe. I'm going to say it like a broken record. You can disagree with me, but just hear me out. Take the passages. Seek the Holy Spirit to show you where I'm wrong. And pray for me if I'm wrong that he corrects me not to repeat these errors. And then say, I disagree with you. That's fine. But we don't have to fight over this. We don't have to fight and condemn each other. Okay? Okay, now. Is a sign of God's love and goodness that he gives you life and nourishment? Is that a sign of God's grace and love and goodness? According to the Bible, when God gives you life and health and and nourishment. Isn't that a sign of God's love and grace? Matthew 5, 43 to 48. Matthew 5, 43 to 48. Because here I'm going to trouble you, man. I'm really going to trouble you. Oh, boy. You sure you want me to go meet or do you want me to keep it surface? Because I, I, I know I'm going to get somebody upset. I know I am. I guarantee I'm going to get you upset. I know I will. Okay. Matthew 5, 43, 48. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father. Ah, I'm going to unpack that. We're going to come back to that in a minute. So that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. To be a son of God is to reflect God's character and attitude. And when you love your enemy and pray for him, you are reflecting God's character and attitude towards his enemy. Like your father loves his enemies, you love your enemies if you're a son of your father because you have to resemble your father. If you don't love your enemies, you don't resemble God, so you're not his son in that sense. You see how it makes sense now? So that you may be sons of your father who's in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain. Well, notice, how do we know that God loves his enemies? And so for his children, we have to love our enemies too because if we're sons of God, we're called to reflect God's character. And act like him on earth because your father allows even evildoers to bask in the sunshine. And your father even sends rain on the crops of evildoers so they can be nourished and eat from the crop. Evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet... Only your brothers. If you greet only your brothers. Watch here. <clears throat> what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. You understand what the Lord just said? If you're a son of God, then you're going to reflect God's character and resemble God on earth. You want me there? So if my father in heaven... Shows love and kindness to even to his enemies because he gives them life and he sustains them and nourishes them just like the righteous. Then I, being a child of God, when my enemy does something to slander me, I don't repay evil for evil. I treat him the way my father treats his enemies. But that doesn't mean the father continues to indefinitely bless his enemies. 
because there's a point in which God's enemies reach a level of sin where God says, enough kindness, now judgment. Is that sinking in? Because, folks, I'm going to ask you a question now. I'm going to ask you a question. Love is more than an emotion. Love is more than an emotion. It's an action. It's an attitude. It's a disposition. I'll explain what I mean. You are married. There are times in which you can't stand your spouse, but that doesn't give you a license to abuse them and mistreat them. You are still to show them acts of love even when you don't feel it. According to the Bible, love is more than a feeling, and this is what we don't learn. I haven't learned it to my shame, and God have mercy. Love is more than feeling. It's action and a disposition. So if you're married and you can't stand your spouse, God does not give you a license to then abuse her. You still show her acts of love even if you don't feel like you're in love with her. That's your duty and moral obligation. You with me there? So if we go beyond the feeling and see that love is an attitude and an action, man, I can't stand her. Today she's just not doing it for me. Hey, honey, Lord bless you. What can I do for you? Of course, sweetheart. See the point? In my heart, I'm not feeling it. But God says, who cares? The fool trusts in his heart. You do what I say. You don't feel like loving her. You love her still. Okay, now, you, you know why I'm ranting here? Can I tell you why I'm ranting here? If love is an action, and one of the actions that demonstrates God's love for his enemies is that he allows them to benefit from the sunshine and the rain and allows them to benefit from his creation so they can eat, right, have health and clothing, raiment, what does this tell you about God's attitude towards Satan and that God hasn't consumed Satan, destroyed Satan, but tolerates Satan and is patient with Satan to the point he allows Satan to even approach him in heaven and speak to him face to face? What do we call that? No, not you, Pedro. No, 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 man. No, 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 no. God forbid you are to hate Satan. Not talking about you. Don't you ever think I'm telling you love the devil. God forbid. I'm telling you about God, not you. Because God can love things that you are forbidden from loving. God can love things that he doesn't want you to love. You know why? Because God can love a thing that's bad and not be corrupted by it. But you being corrupt, when you love something that's bad, there's a tendency you may succumb to that thing and be polluted by it. You understand the difference? Let me repeat that again. I'm going to show you from Scripture. God can love a thing that's bad for you to love because God can love something and not be affected or corrupted and tainted by it. Whereas because you're corrupt and tainted, you can love something that's harmful and succumb to it and be polluted by it. Can I give you an example from Scripture? Can I give you an example from Scripture? You want me to show you? Of course you hate Muhammad because he died an accursed son of Satan who's damned people to hell and destroyed human life. John 3, verse 16. Watch the difference now. I'm giving you Bible here. You said you want me to stretch you and challenge you and trouble you to think more deeply and biblically. John 3, 16. Uh, Bible facts. Do you want me to now turn it against you? Judas was already condemned because Jesus knew that Judas was a son of the devil. Did Jesus stop showing love to Judas or did he love him till the end, even though he knew Judas is of the devil and Judas betrayed him? What in the world are you talking about? Because if I apply your logic, God already knows those will be damned and reject him, but he still loves them anyway. Why? Because he knows who's going to reject him and remain condemned. So you're not saying anything and you're not making sense with that argument. John 3 verse 16. One more time. John 3 verse 16. Bible facts. Thank you, brother. I love you, bro. See, that was humble of you when you accept correction. God bless you, bro. John 3, 16. 
For God so loved the world. Pay attention. For God so loved the world. So God loves this fallen world that he gave his only begotten son to redeem it. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So notice, God loves this world that's steeped in darkness under the influence of sin. He loves it to the extent that he sends his son to redeem it. But now notice what the same author, John, tells you about your attitude towards the world. 1 John 2, verses 15 to 17. 1 John 2, verses 15 to 17. Everyone following me? You still trucking along? You're still learning or am I losing you? 1 John 2, verses 15 to 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. Wait, God loves the world that I'm not supposed to love. God tells me don't love this world even though he loves it. Wow, why? Why? Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. But wait, God, you love the world. Yes, I can love the world and not be polluted by it. I love the world to save it from its darkness. Your love for the world will cause you to stumble and succumb to its temptations and corrupt yourselves. So I'm saying you don't love it so you don't come under its influence. I can love it because it cannot influence me to corrupt myself. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Making sense now? Keck, if I'm a genius, give glory to the Holy Spirit because he's the one giving you the wisdom for the glory of Christ. Making sense now? So God can love a thing that you are forbidden from loving. Why? Because your love for a thing may bring you under its influence and corrupting, polluting effect. God can love the most depraved evil thing and not be tainted by it because God is immutably holy and pure. Okay, Ninos, thank you. Hey, are we going to go walk tonight, by the way, as a Nagani, or are we going to do it in the morning? Everyone got, getting it now? So isn't it, I, hey, Carly, my sister, Ninos is my best friend from childhood. Me and him have known each other since we were five. My goodness, sister, you just blocked my best friend. <laughs> oh my goodness me and him have been buddies since we were five and he's the one I go hiking with him and his lovely wife okay now let's focus All right, are we ready now sorry Nino she just decided to time you out for five minutes even though I just said love her enemies, she decided to hate her enemy. But she hated what she thought was my enemy. So that's her love for me. Thank you, sister. Somebody's triggers happies. All right. Okay, now. Okay. You see how amazing God is that in tolerating Satan's existence and not consuming him and destroying him, that is actually God showing love even to Satan. And how does Satan respond? Continue in his rebellion against God and destroy as many lives as possible. Do you see the depth of God's love? I mean, if you see it from that angle, Satan then deserves the hell that Jesus will send him to. That even God tolerating you and even your very life is a gift from God because you wouldn't live if it's not sustaining you. Even allowing you to come before his very presence and not consuming you in his holy wrath. That is a display of love even for you. And how do you respond? By continually wrecking havoc on creation and making lives miserable. No, Zena, he's at a point now. His nature is what we call irremediable. It cannot be remedied. I mean, God can't. When I say can't, he cannot remedy himself. 
Evil has become second nature to him. He is evil. Evil is he. Right? It's even more mind-boggling, the love of God, right? Yep. He is fixed in his will and his desires. It makes God's love even more amazing and much bigger than we thought, right? It makes God's love even more bigger and much more amazing than we thought. What, why does it matter? Satan, Belial in Hebrew, Satan, Belial, Diablos in Greek. What does it matter? Exactly, Candace. The more God shows you love, the more he's patient with you, the more he tolerates you, the more your sin, the greater wrath you're storing for yourself. So notice Satan has been sinning from the beginning of creation. Imagine the wrath that he's storing for himself because of the misery and the hell he's afflicted on creation from the start. There is no being that has done more harm, more evil, brought greater destruction than Satan. Exactly what he has. He's the Jibril of Muhammad. Did that sink in before I move on? Did that sink in before I move on? So, folks, God is a father in the sense that he created everyone and he gives life to everyone and he sustains everyone, every creature. And so there's a sense in which every created thing, spiritual or human, is a child of God in that sense. Is that clear? Is that clear? So there's a sense in which everyone is a child of God. In that if you're a creature, God created you. God gives you life. God sustains you. He's your life giver and sustainer, which is what we expect fathers to do. If you father a child, you're responsible to care for that child, to sustain that child, and provide for that child. So and there's a sense in which everyone is a child of God. And there's a sense in which not everyone is a child of God. You see how it works? You see how complex it is? You see how deep it gets that if you just assume one definition of sonship or fatherhood, you're going to confuse yourself and you're going to see contradictions when none exist. There are no contradictions. But now let me blow you away a little more. Can I blow you away a little more? Can we take a little further and blow you away a little more? Yeah, see, Alex already anticipated that. Alex, you're a genius, brother. You anticipated that. Now, if by father I mean creator, sustainer, life giver, did the father create all creation? Did the father create all creation? Did the son create all creation with the father? Did the father and son together create all creation and sustain all creation? Did the Holy Spirit create all creation and give life to all creation? So did the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all three of them together create all things, give life? That means there's a sense in which God the Father is your Father, Jesus is your Father, and the Holy Spirit is your Father, without Jesus and the Spirit being God the Father. Whoa. There's a sense in which the Father is your Father, the Son is your Father, and the Spirit is your Father because the three persons created all creation, gives life to all creation, sustains all creation. So in that sense, they are our Father. Yes, Carly. He's everlasting Father in that he is your life, but he's not God the Father. <whistles> Happy-go-lucky. Why are you worried about me when I'm in the midst of a teaching? Here, happy-go-lucky. Let me stop. My session, let's talk about how I'm doing. Let's have a, some chai, tea. Let's talk about my personal life over a cup of tea in the live stream and ignore everyone else. My goodness, what is <laughs> Oh, boy. Only a Christian is going to ask me in the midst of a session, Sam, how are you doing? How was your day? Okay, guys, forget you. Happy, my day was great. Can I get you some tea while we're at it? Chai, you want some milk in it? Rebbe spy, I got that dough. Let me get Gilu on you. Okay, so angels are the sons of God 
because God creates angels, sustains angels, gives life to angels, and gives them their characteristics and potencies and their position. So in that sense, they are the sons of God. Now let's go to Luke 3.38. Luke 3.38. See? Now you got Zach texting me. Ninos Michelle. Thank you, Candy. He just uh, sent me a message. Let's see what he says. Tonight. Okay. Walking. All right, Nino. So I hope you're listening. Thank you, Can uh, Candy, Candace, or Ca Carly Walker. Okay, listen. Yes, we are walking tonight. We're walking. Tonight. Poor guy couldn't tell me that. He had to send me a voice text. Thank you, sister. We love you. All right. Now, Luke three thirty-eight. The son of Enos. The son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Did you catch it? Adam is the son of God. Exactly, Jade. Did you see Luke 3.38? Adam is the son of God. In what way is he God's son? Because he's a direct creation of God. God formed him from virgin soil that was watered by a stream. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul and sustained him. But wait, who created Adam? The Father did. Jesus Christ, the Son, did. And the Holy Spirit did. So in that sense, all three persons, they're not the same person. God is triune. Father, Son, and Spirit. They are the one Father, one Creator, and life giver of Adam and all creation. With me there? So that makes sense. So is there a contradiction when in Hebrews 1.5 it says, God never said to an angel, you are my son, today I have begotten you, even though angels are the sons of God. There is no contradiction. You know why? Because it's talking about a different kind of sonship. You see how it makes sense now? It's all sinking in. It all makes sense. No contradiction. Right? Sink it in because I got a lot more to unpack. There's a lot more meat for me to unpack. No, kick, kick, that's not the reason. My brother, don't get hung up on the word begotten because David was begotten. Solomon was begotten. Israel was begotten by God. You're getting hung up on the word begotten. Don't get confused with the term begotten. Begotten simply means, right, in this context that either God brought you into being and gave you life. It can mean that. So angels are begotten in that sense. Or he appointed you for a specific task or a specific role or a specific responsibility. So in that sense, he begot you. Or he sent the spirit to make you spiritually alive and united you to Christ. So in that sense, he begot you. The term begotten itself can have different meanings in different contexts. Yes, exactly, Jake. It doesn't always mean to be brought into being. Exactly. With me there? Is that clear? Before I move on, I just want to show you the different ways in which someone can be a son of God, a daughter of God. Here, let me show you again. Deuteronomy 32, verse 6. Let's go back to it again. Deuteronomy 32, verse 6. One more time. Do you thus repay the Lord, you foolish and senseless people? Is not he your father who created you, who made you and established you? Okay, now, Deuteronomy 32, 18 to 20. Deuteronomy 32, 18 to 20. Deuteronomy 32, verses 18 to 20. You were unmindful of the rock that bore you. There you go, kick. Speaking to Israel, God bore you, gave birth to you like a woman in labor pains. And you forgot the God who gave you birth. There you go. God begets them. Not physically, not sexually, but spiritually. The Lord saw it and spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be. For they are perverse generation children in whom is no faithfulness. So there you go. God saying, I gave birth to you, Israel. I bore you from my womb. 
begot you. Now, obviously, God is not a physical being. He's not a physical woman. He doesn't have a physical womb. It's spiritual metaphorical language. And now notice one thing, though. When God did birth them, when did God birth Israel to be his son? What marks the birth of the nation as God's covenant people? Exactly, Keck. Because Deuteronomy 32 is applied to Jesus. No, not with Abraham, no. When did God set them apart and mark them to be his sons and daughters? When he redeemed them out of Egypt. But notice they already existed prior to that time. So he didn't beget a nation that didn't already consciously exist, that wasn't already alive. They're already alive. They're already, already in Egypt. And his redeeming them out of bondage was that one definitive act in time that made them his covenant people and therefore his sons and daughters. Clear before I move on? Before I move on, is it making sense? I just did. He either begets you, Kek, I already said that, brother, by bringing you into being and giving you life, or by transforming you inwardly by the Spirit, making you spiritually alive, or by appointing you to a specific station in life or a role or responsibility. I just did. The kings of Israel, they became God's son when he appointed them to their position of being his rulers on earth. The nation became God's son when he redeemed them out of his, uh, Egypt to become his nation on earth, representing them to the other nations and so on and so forth. I just did. Right? Now let's talk about believers as sons and daughters of God. What does it mean for us who believe in Christ to be a son or daughter of God? Are you now ready for that? Are you ready for that? What that means? Exactly, Jade. Good. Oh, good. Thank you, Anna. Matthew 5, verse 9. Matthew 5, verse 9. Thank you, Robert Ducky. You're the one. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Did you make the connection? If you make peace, not simply talk about peace, that shows you are a son of God. Why? What's the connection with making peace and being a son or daughter of God? Because God is the God of peace. Peace comes from him. One of his characteristics is peace. Romans 16, verse 20. Romans 16, verse 20. So let me explain what it means to be a son or daughter of God as a follower of Jesus Christ. Romans 16, verse 20. The God of peace, the God who is peace, peace comes from him. We'll soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So did you catch it? If you're a son of God, then you're going to reflect God's moral character. If you're a daughter of God, you're going to reflect the nature, the characteristics of God. If God is holy, you'll be holy. If God is a God of peace, you'll be a God of peace. If he's a God of justice, you'll be. In other words, a child of God is one who reflects the nature of God, resembles God, and lives as God lives. You got it? Matthew 5, 43 to 48. Yep, be holy as the Lord your God is holy. Matthew 5, 43 to 48. Thank you, Brainiac. I hope I look better. Matthew 5, 43, 48 again. You have heard that I it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be the sons of your father who is in heaven. Did you catch it? If God is your father, then you're going to reflect your father, act like your father, resemble your father, right? You're going to bear resemblance to your father. So if Satan is your father, 
You're going to act like Satan, resemble Satan. If God is your father, you're going to reflect God. So if God loves his enemies, you'll love your enemies. If God hates sin, you'll hate sin. If God loves justice, you'll love justice. If God is about bringing peace, you'll bring peace. Brainiac, are you in love with me? Do you want to marry me? Because you can't stop talking about me. Is the session about how good Sam looks and how much weight he lost, or is it about Jesus? Brainiac, here, why don't I give you my number so you can call me and ask me out and take me to dinner? What the heck is wrong with you, man? Focus on Jesus. My goodness. <laughs> Sam, you look good. You lost weight. Gee, thank you, Brainiac. What's wrong with you Christians? One guy wants to ask me how my day is. He wants to have tea with me. The other guy wants to propose. Sam, you look good. You lost weight. Can I ask you out? You're not my type, dude. Okay. What? Tell you what. Why don't you and Happy go out together? Why don't you ask him out and he can ask you how your day is? All right. Okay, let's focus. Are you with me there? So what does it mean for you to be a son or daughter of God? You reflect God's character. In contrast to Satan, John 8, 44. If Satan's your father, you're going to act like Satan. John 8, 44. John 8, 44. You are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. You see that? If Satan is your father, you're going to act like Satan and do what he wants. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he's a liar and the father of lies. So you catch it? Satan's your father. You're going to act like Satan. Talk like Satan. Do the things that Satan likes and delights in. You see the point? But, but if God is your father, you're going to hate the things God hates and hate the things of the devil and love the things that God loves and walk in those things. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. Amen. Sydney, yes, he does. Who told you God doesn't hate? Sydney, God hates sin, and he also will end up hating persistent, rebellious, stiff-necked evildoers if they don't repent and reach a point of no return. I already did a session on this. Where would you get that God doesn't hate? I'm going to show you that's wrong. He does hate. Again, 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all, notice, you also be holy, right, in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So what does it mean to be a child of God? To reflect God's character, to reflect God's moral <clears throat> being, right? To train yourself to act like God, think like God, and live the way God lives until it becomes second nature by the power of the Holy Spirit. Here. The most obvious passage, 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. 1 John 3, verses 1 to 3. 1 John 3, verses 1 to 3. Watch here. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. Not just a slave, but a child of God. So we are. That's what we are. Now notice, we are children of God because God said it. And if he said it, he can't lie. Okay? The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Now watch verse 2 and 3. Verse 2 and 3. Beloved, we are God's children. Now we are. That's what we are now. But what will, will we be has not yet appeared. I'm a child of God right now. But what that implies in the fullest sense is still future. And I'll explain what he means here. Guys, you got to pay attention. Don't let Satan distract you. Okay. We are God's children right now. And yet what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him 
purifies himself as he is pure. Did you catch it? If I'm a child of God, I'm pure like God is pure. I'm pure like Jesus is pure. I'm pure like the Holy Spirit is pure. So what is John saying? This is what we call the already but not yet. There's something that theologians have come up with. It's called the already but not yet concept. What does that mean? I already am a son of God. But what that entails hasn't been realized yet. Because to be a son of God means when the Lord comes, I will be morally incorruptible. Sin will be removed from me completely. And I will never, ever sin again. And I will be deathless. What the early church and what Orthodox call theosis. That's what God has destined me for. As a child of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm training myself to be like God. But when Christ comes, I won't need to train myself anymore. It will now be second nature and instinctive because sin will be removed and I'll be chained in such a way that I only act like God and cannot act contrary. That's the future. Thank you, Lisa. God bless you. Yep, theosis. That's your goal. You know what it means to be a child of God? Let it sink in because we don't emphasize. A child of God means you will be deathless like your eldest brother, Jesus. You will be morally incorruptible like your eldest brother, Jesus. You will no longer sin, crave sin, succumb to sin. No more lust. No more hatred that's unjustifiable. No more gossip. No more slander. No more sexual immorality. No more murder. None of that. No more disease. No more pain. No more anguish. No more misery. We will experience the life of God because we will be eternal partakers of the life of God incorruptibly, immortally. That's your destiny. That's your destiny. If you believe, if you believe, meaning I won't get up in the morning struggling with lustful desires, sinful passions, sinful cravings, and succumbing. I won't get up in the morning with unrighteous anger and hatred toward those who I think have offended me. I won't get up in the morning having envy, having jealousy, coveting the things I shouldn't covet. I won't get up in the morning and causing people to stumble and attacking and insulting people, that will be done away with. And I will be like my God. I won't be almighty like God. I won't be uncreated like God. I won't be timeless like God. But I'll be like God in that I will be morally incorruptible. I cannot corrupt myself by sin anymore because sin will be removed. And I will be deathless, living in a deathless body, to enjoy God perfectly, intimately, forever and ever and ever. That's the promise of Scripture. Revelation 21, verses 1 to 7. Revelation 21, verses 1 to 7. This is what the early church and the Orthodox call theosis. And that's what it is. You can learn a lot from the Orthodox church, from the Catholic church, from the Assyrian church. Don't limit yourself. There's a lot of truth in all these traditions that are beautiful and biblical. Relation 21, verses 1 to 7. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. The things that are now will be done away with. Death, disease, plague, murder, adultery, hatred, corrupt policemen, murdering a man, corrupt judges, Done away with in Jesus' name sooner than later. And the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. Now God will dwell in the Garden of Eden like he did before Adam and Eve sinned. But this time when he comes to dwell... Sin will not expel him from our prisons because there'll be no more sin. God on earth, Father, Son, and Spirit on earth with glorified men. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. 
and God himself will be with them as their God. Now watch. Watch here. Okay, let's keep reading. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. No more crying out of anguish and misery and depression. And there'll be no more death. Neither shall there be mourning. You won't mourn. Nor crying. Nor pain. No more cancer. No more disease. None of that anymore. No more emotional pain. Mental pain. It will be done away with. For the former things have passed away. Now notice God speaks. Verse 5. And he was seated on the throne and said, Behold, I'm making all things new. New. I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. Take it to the bank. It is done. Guaranteed, I will do this. If Jesus is alive and he's not make believe and he is alive, this will happen. And may it happen sooner than later. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, to the thirsty, <clears throat> I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Free, I give it to you to quench you forever. No more hunger, no more thirst, no more pain, no more death. And now notice seven. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he'll be my son. You want me there? Branagh, why don't you go find you a tree outside and start just like petting it? Because you keep asking questions that have nothing to do with the topic. Go outside and pet the tree and pretend that's a tree of life and be encouraged by it. For the rest of you who are paying attention, right? Branagh, keep it up. You're not going to last too long. Okay, brother? Keep it up. I'm sensing there's something not right about you, but it's okay. I'll be patient with you. Let's see how far you get. For the rest of you paying attention, not asking irrelevant questions like about the tree of life. Even if I mention the tree of life, how does that change the point I made? Okay, yeah. Brainac, yeah, yeah. Guys, can we send Brainac? God, God bless you, Brainac. It was good to see you. Lord bless you. Send it. Yalla. Come on, mods. All right. For the rest of you paying attention, I'm going to start yeah. For the rest of you paying attention, not being distracted, focus now. Just want you to focus because it's serious and it's somber. Jesus has sworn and he's promised. Oh, my daughter's calling me. Hold on. Bobby, I'm doing a live stream. Oh. Can I call you when I'm done? Okay. I love you. I love you. I love you, sweet. I miss you. I'll call you when I'm done. Okay. God bless you. Bye. Bye, Bobby. Okay. Beautiful illustration about the point I'm going to make. The promise is a parent will never have to bury their child ever again. A spouse will never have to bury their loved one ever again. Children will never have to bury their parents ever again when this day comes. Spouses will never have to experience marital infidelity ever again. Children will never experience broken homes, broken relationships, broken marriages, and being raised by dysfunctional parents and or abused by them ever again that will never ever exist ever again that's the promise of jesus there'll be no more drug addiction no more porn addiction no more adultery no more children getting abused and raped or sold and slave markets, sex trafficking, no more of that. That will be done. And it will be a perfect earth, perfect human beings, and perfect deathless bodies, dwelling in the perfect presence of the triune God, being flooded in the infinite love, 
compassion, and mercy of the trying God forever and ever and ever. And no more sin, no more Satan, no more death, no more misery. That's the promise of Jesus Christ. But until that day, until that day, I have to experience the heartache of having my two angels, my gift from Jesus, calling me from another state whom I haven't touched and hugged and kissed for a year. And only God knows when I'll be set free from this corrupt legal system, use of the devil, and when I will have them and kiss them and embrace them and love them and put them to sleep. See, timing. Believe me, this was God's timing. This call, God's timing. To have to see the face of my firstborn, my angel, who aches for me and I ache for her, and I can't do anything about it. But another man in an immoral relationship is in that home, putting them to sleep and hugging them and kissing them. Tell me that's not God's timing. Tell me that was not God's timing for me. I haven't heard from her in about four or five days. She hasn't called me in about five days, maybe more. You think it's a coincidence I got this call? This call is a reminder of the brokenness and the misery of this world and the pain in my heart. And a reminder from Jesus, this too will end. This too will end. It is only a season, man of God. You will go through this misery because of the sins of others or your own sins that you're now suffering the consequences thereof. But I promise you, man of God, it's only a season and this too will end. And a new heaven and a new earth will be ushered in by the trying God. You see? Folks, don't think it's easy for me. When I see her calling me and I see her beauty, when I see her face and her sister's face, my angels, and I see their smile and their beauty, I see Jesus' beauty shining through them. Even though I can't kiss them and hug them and say, your Baba loves you so much that he'll die for you. All right? Sir. Thank you, Sarah. So we know our Lord is risen and he's alive. He is the risen Lord. He's not make-believe. Jesus is alive. Jesus is real. And he will make known his presence to you and remind you, I am real. I exist. And I'm in love with you. Even though you may doubt and you may struggle and you may wonder where I am. I've always been at your side. And I've never left you. And I will never leave you. Because I'm in love with you. Okay, remember that. So what does it mean to be a son of God, a daughter of God? As believers, as believers, it means to reflect the character of your God. To walk like Jesus, act like Jesus, love like Jesus, pray like Jesus, worship like Jesus. Because Jesus became a man. To show us what the perfect human life looks like. And the perfect human life is Jesus' human life. The life he lived on earth. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, he calls us to share in. In other words, a child of God is one who lives the life of Jesus. Who allows Jesus to live in and through him. In order to draw others to his beauty. That's what, it's, that's what it means to be a child of God. Galatians 2, verse 20. Galatians 2, verse 20. If you only know the pain in my heart to hear from her and not be able to be in her life. You only know. Some of you do because you're going through it. Galatians 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. Pay attention. This is what it means to be a child of God. Guys, pay attention. This is why Paul is my hero. And I pray I can love Jesus the way Paul did by the power of the Holy Spirit. Notice, I have been crucified with Christ. When Christ got nailed on the cross, 
I was nailed with him. It is no longer I who live. I died. I don't live in this body anymore. But Christ who lives in me. And the life I, I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You understand? That's what it means to be a child of God. It means, Jesus, I was crucified with you, and I died to myself. I died to my passions, and I died to the world. So now I'm dead, and you live in this body. This body is yours to live in and through for your glory. That's what it means. That's what it means. You understand now what it means to be a child of God? You know what it means? And easier said than done because I'm a miserable wretch and failure. And I'll make a confession to you. I'm going to make a confession where I fail. Where I fell. I'll make a confession, but let me first show you what the point of it is. It's getting up and saying, Lord Jesus, not I, but your will be done. Your desires be fulfilled in and through me. So, Lord Jesus, save me from my own desires that grieve you and go against your will. Live your life in me and through me. Mortify that which you despise and set me free from it. Give me the power and strength this because I cannot do it in my own strength. Live through me for your glory. And guys, let's be honest. Easier said than done, isn't it? Easier said than done. Isn't it? Let's be honest. I can tell you I got up in the morning and I failed Jesus today. Instead of saying you live your life, I lived according to my sinful passions and succumbed. May God have mercy on me, a pathetic sinner. But that's the goal. That's the goal. And here's the good news. Here's the good news. The day will come where you won't succumb anymore to your flesh. The day will come. Sin will be removed from you. And all you will do is that which delights Jesus. That's the promise of Jesus Christ. So don't let Satan trick you. Let me tell you a, tra a strategy of Satan. And we're going to sum up real quickly because I, I got to do a part five, Lord willing, tomorrow. The strategy of Satan. Here's the strategy of Satan. The Bible says, do not be unaware of the schemes of the devil. Know how Satan thinks to guard yourself against his schemes. Here's one of his schemes. Are you ready? Here's one of his schemes. Are you ready? He will tempt you to succumb to your fleshly desire. Because Satan can't make you sin. Sin in you can't make you sin. What sin in you will do, try to make you succumb and tempt you. And Satan will try to make you succumb and tempt you, but, but they can't make you because you've been set free from the Spirit and have the light of the Spirit in you. So you succumb. And now you feel guilty. And now Satan starts working. And tell me if this is not speaking to you, if this is not a word for you. Tell me if it's not. So Satan starts whispering, you wicked, dirty, fake hypocrite. Now that you just sinned and you did what you're supposed to, you have the audacity to go before Jesus? How dare you even mention his name? You should be ashamed to even get near Jesus. You know what? You're so filthy, you need to stay away. You're rotten to the core. You disgust Jesus. You know why he does that? Can I tell you why he does that? Because the more he keeps you away from Jesus, the weaker you become in resisting sin, and sin becomes that much more stronger over you so that you become entangled by it again. That's his strategy. He tries to strip you of your weapons to leave you weaponless and powerless so that you are now utterly weak and of no use. And now he's got you. So you know what you say? You know what you do? You do what Jesus says. 1 John 1, 7 to 10. 1 John 1, verses 7 to 10. 
Exactly, Ariel. That's his strategy. Go ahead, man. Keep doing it. You're too rotten and dirty. Let me show you what the Bible says. 1 John 1, 7 to 10. Let me show you what the Bible says. 1 John 1, 7 to 10. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive, deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have no not sin, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Did you catch what Jesus said? Jesus said, Satan is a liar. You're not too dirty for me to cleanse you. My blood is all powerful. It's more powerful than the stain of your sin. Just confess, turn back, I'll forgive you, and resume the race. You see that, Anna? He was playing with your mind. You understand what our Lord is saying? Jesus is now telling you, who are you going to believe? Your, those satanic whispers or me? Satan is a liar and the father of lies. I am telling you, I am the way, the truth, and life, and I cannot lie. You confess that sin and you turn to me. I will cleanse you and forgive you because I love you. So are you going to believe him, the liar, and father of all lies, or me, the God of all truth? Who are you going to believe? Luke 17, verses 3 to 4. And we're going to wrap it up. I'm going to do a part five, God willing, tomorrow. Luke 17, verses 3 to 4. Luke 17, verses 3 to 4. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, this is Jesus speaking. Jesus speaking. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and, and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Do you think Jesus is going to contradict what he says? you think Jesus is a hypocrite? He tells you to do one thing and he won't do it? If he's telling you, you wicked sinner, if your brother sins and repents, you better forgive him 70 times seven, 77 times a day. you think Jesus won't do it? In fact, because today was a hard day, I succumb. By way of confession, I succumb. God, forgive me. And may the Lord give me grace not to justify my sin, but turn away from it. I succumbed to my passions. And I felt so unworthy. I didn't want to live stream. But I cried out to Jesus, say, Lord, have mercy. I'm struggling. Set me free by the power of the blood of Jesus. Cleanse me so that I can be used for your glory. And I'm here. You see? Because I'm trusting Jesus and taking him on his word. Lord, have mercy on me. Do not let me disqualify myself. Do not let me be a hypocrite. And do not let me succumb to the whisperings of Satan so he keeps me away. God, show me that you are cleansing me and that you're going to change me and that you're patient with me and you're going to use me to glorify because I want to love you and live for you till I die. Lord, I can't live without you. I can't. I honestly can't. I'm not just saying it. I can't. Let me tell you where I failed. Can I make a way of confession where I failed in the marriage? Can I now be open as a brother to you and show you where I failed in my marriage? Can I be honest with you? And the Lord showed me this. Showed me this. And I kept saying, God, help me, please. Here's where I failed. I was not able to be Jesus to the mother of my children. I wasn't. I repaid evil for evil. When she attacked, when she insulted, because she's broken. I was the one who's supposed to be spiritually mature. She was, she was broken. I know if I could have been Jesus to her, I would have seen a miracle take place in her heart. But instead, I thought of my own feelings, my own hurt, my own needs over against her, Instead of dying to my needs and being Jesus to her and letting her 
do what she did until God cleansed her and she could see the love of Jesus, I failed. I repaid evil for evil. May God forgive me for failing. And I couldn't be Jesus to her. Jesus loved a Judas to the end. And I'm not saying she's a Judas. God forbid she's not. She's a creature created by Christ. And Jesus loves her. And I pray Jesus will reveal himself to her and save her. But I'm being honest. And I'm not trying to be a warrior humble. I know where I fail. I couldn't be Jesus to her. I couldn't lay my life down and be Jesus to her. And I shunned her and I avoided her because let me tell you something about myself. Let me just share something about myself. When I feel like I'm being abused and hurt, you know what I do? I avoid that person. That's what I've done since I was a child. My reaction as a child, if someone hurt me and abused me, I would avoid that person, never contact that person and hide from that person. Well, that's what I did. Instead of just being Jesus and loving her and running to her and affirming her, I did what was natural, which was sinful. Avoid her, shut her down, keep her away. And pretty much we became roommates. So I failed. Because I did what was natural to me which was sinful. I did what I've done all my life, run away from someone who hurts me and abuses me. Instead of saying, that's okay, Lord, let her unleash all that anger and rage, use me to heal her so she can fall in love with Jesus. And I did. That's why she despises me. That's why she thinks I'm a hypocrite. That's why she says, I don't see Jesus in you. And folks, she's absolutely right. I could not be Jesus to her. I could not be Jesus to her. And this will be one regret in my life. This will be one regret in my life. There's one person I failed in being Jesus to, and it was the mother of my children. Because I need healing. I'm damaged, and I need the great physician to heal me. Right? But it already came at a price, King of Kings. My failure means the destruction of my family and my children suffering because she's looking for a man to be her father. She's looking for daddy because her father wasn't around. And she doesn't realize no man can be what only Jesus can be for her. And that's what she needs to realize. She needs to know there is not a human man that can fulfill her heart except Jesus. And Jesus will not honor her desires and bring her a man when she's in sin and unrepented and continue this pattern. This is why Christians, let me leave you with this. And I hope you were blessed. I hope you were blessed, challenged. And I hope you fell more in love with the God of the Bible and his word. Christians, let me share something with you. Honestly, you single men and women. I speak from my heart because I love you for the sake of Jesus. If you are going into marriage, let me, let me listen, please listen, please listen for the glory of Jesus Christ. If you are looking for marriage in order to find a man to satisfy or a woman to satisfy you, your marriage will fail. You have to already be content in Jesus, satisfied with Jesus, in love with Jesus. Otherwise, if you're looking for the spouse to be what only Jesus can be, I promise you, your spouse will disappoint you. You're going to regret marrying that person and hate your marriage and want out of it. Trust me. You're not going to get married because you're looking to the other person to be your savior. You have one Savior, Jesus Christ. You're looking to that partner to become one flesh as you both look to Jesus for your healing and your love and seek to be Jesus to the other, and that's when your marriage will, your marriage will succeed. My marriage failed because she was looking to me to be Jesus, and I was looking to her to be that mother that I needed, that I didn't have, and when she wasn't but abusive, I said, the heck with you, and... Here I am. 
divorced, broken, with two daughters who keep asking me, Baba, where are you? When are you going to come home? So with that said, let me end it with one thing about Jesus Christ and sonship. Something, And then tomorrow we're going to do part five. Jesus Christ and sonship. So folks, for the sake of the Lord and for the sake of my daughters, pray for their mother. Folks, she's a creature of Jesus. Her name is Michelle. No matter how I feel about her, how she feels about me, she doesn't exist for me. I don't exist for her. We exist for Jesus. But folks, pray for her. Her name's Michelle. Beg Jesus to appear to her miraculously because she's a creature that Jesus created to delight in him, to be in love with him as he's in love with her. Please pray for her. Don't mind me. Don't mind my anger. Don't mind me. Forget me. Guys, it's not about me. It's about the Lord. And I'm saying this honestly. I will rejoice and I will be in tears. In tears when I see her in love with Jesus, sold out for Jesus, not sinning anymore, but doing what is right in the sake of the Lord. Because then she can be my sister in Christ and she will live forever in the presence of the Lord. So pray for her. Let me end it with this about Jesus and him being the firstborn. In this family of God, I just gave you, and go back and re-listen to the session. Go back and re-listen to the session. In this family of God, I, did, I showed you God is a father in different ways, in different senses. And you can be a child of God in a different way, in a different sense. Was that clear? You got that, right? Amen, Danielle. Pray for her, please. Michelle Gabriel, pray for her. And notice she has two beautiful names. Michelle, Michael, Michelle, the feminine form, Michael, and Gabriel, the name of two angels. And I can tell you, she love bombs my children. She loves my daughters. Okay. Now, in the family of God, right? You guys understand? You understand? You can be a son in a different sense, in a different way, and God can be your father in a different sense, in a different way. Was that clear? Did you understand all that? Because I gave you a lens, by the grace of God, a lens by which now you can find all the different ways in which you can be a child of God and God be your father. I hope that was clear. Now, in God's family, God has a firstborn son, a firstborn son, firstborn son, Jesus Christ. Now, here's where people get confused. Well, if Jesus is God's firstborn, then he came later in life because a parent is always older than a child. Have you heard that? Now, you guys know I'm going with this because I already mentioned it. But there's some newbies here because I want to destroy that. See, if Jesus is God's firstborn, then he's not eternal. That means he was brought into being by his parent because no child is as old as his parent. Let me destroy that argument. You guys already know this, many of you, but there's some newbies here. It is not true. Listen to this carefully. It's not true that a firstborn child is not as old as his or her parents. Let me explain. Zena, let me use you as an example because you're new to this. And I want to help you. Zena, are you the oldest in your family? Zena, want to use her because she's hearing it for the first time. We're going to end the session. Okay, you're the oldest, right? Now, again, understand why I'm asking you the question. It's not personal. How old are you, sister? Exactly, Magda. I want them to know. How old are you, sister? 19. Listen to my question carefully. You're the oldest. You're 19. How old is your father? How old is your father? No. Listen to me again. Your father is not 49 because he wasn't a father until you were born. I'm not asking how old is he as a man. How old is he as a father? How old is your father? Father. How old is your father? 19. No, Zena, your earthly dad, please don't scare me. Your earthly dad didn't create the heavens and the earth. Your earthly 19, you cannot be a parent without a child. Your firstborn child makes you a parent. So your father is 19 years old because his firstborn is 19 years old. 
No child, no parent. So the firstborn makes you a parent. Now, folks, here's my question. God is father by his very nature. He's the eternal father. How can he be eternal father without an eternal son? So what's my point? You're, you're only a parent when you have a child. That's why I am, as a father, I'm only 10 years old because my firstborn is 10. As a father, I'm 10 because my firstborn is 10. I'm just as old as a father as my firstborn is. So if God is the eternal father, then guess what? His son, the firstborn, must be eternal too. The firstborn is what makes you a parent. Jesus is God's firstborn. But God has always been a father because his firstborn has always been a son. Bam. There you go. Say, Christian, how old are you as a father? How old are you as a father, Say, Christian? My brother. How old are you as a father, Sahi Christian? Before the rapture, Khali Olibuk. Magdalene, how old are you as a mother? As a mother, how old are you? 27. Notice, why are you 27? Because your firstborn is 27. Why is Magdalene 10 years old as a mother? Because her firstborn is 10. Carly is 12 years old as a mother. In other words, no child, no parent. To be a parent, you have to have the child. So your child that makes you a parent is special for that reason. That's why the firstborn has special status. The firstborn makes you a parent. So God is the eternal father because his firstborn, Jesus Christ, is the eternal son. The father has always been the father of Jesus. And Jesus has always been the son of the eternal father. Bam, over and with. You see how amazing Jesus is? The Father needs Jesus as much as Jesus needs the Father. And the Father and Son need the Spirit as much as the Spirit needs the Father and Son. That's why they're the one God, inseparable. Hallelujah. We love you, Eternal Father. We love you, Eternal Son. And we love you, Eternal Spirit. Lord Jesus, you're the firstborn of the Father. And because he's always the Father, you've always been his Son. And we confess and believe and acknowledge who you are, the eternal son of the eternal father, the eternal companion of the eternal spirit. And we love you because you first love us. Cover us by your blood, Lord Jesus, and our loved ones, my daughter. Save us, Lord Jesus. Save me from these calamities, from this corrupt system. Keep us healthy and holy in love with you and provide for us. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. We love you, Father, Son, and Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord willing, tomorrow, part five. Look for me between 3 and 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Pray I don't get attacked. Pray I don't succumb to the flesh. Pray God will save me from Satan and his angels and give me favor here to stay here. Pray for my daughters who ache for me. Ask Jesus, Lord, let this be the year I hug them again. And they stay with me and not leave me in Jesus' name. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Amen. Take care.